This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson, and we're back for another season of stories about how we became human. You should know that this episode contains some descriptions of violence that might not be for everyone. Jane Goodall arrived at Gombe National Park in Tanzania on July 14, 1960, to begin the first long-term, detailed study of chimpanzee behavior in the wild. It had been her lifelong dream to do such a study. Nearing the shore, I felt a special excitement, for ever since childhood I had dreamed of studying animals in the wild. A game ranger helped me to pitch camp near the shore. The following morning, I set out alone to locate the elusive animals. You might be able to picture it in your mind. The 26-year-old Jane Goodall, in her shorts, khaki shirt, and Converse sneakers. Her blonde hair pulled back in a ponytail. Sitting on a steep hillside, watching the chimpanzees through her binoculars. From here, I could at least observe the chimpanzees from afar. I had a trunk carried up with a blanket, some tins of beans, coffee, and a kettle. Sometimes I slept up here when the chimps slept in nearby trees. I started filling in the details of their behavior and way of life. Her observations, even from a distance, were new to science. She was learning something new every day. From my mountain perch, I observed how chimpanzees go to bed. A chimpanzee chooses a horizontal fork, then bends down the surrounding leafy branches over it. He holds these in place with his feet, while folding in all the little leafy sprouts for padding. Then he settles down with obvious satisfaction. Only the small infants do not make their own nests, but sleep with their mothers. Eventually, the chimps got used to Goodall's presence, and they allowed her to come near. The closer observation gave her even more insight into their daily lives. The details Jane Goodall was collecting told the story of a complex society and individual lives that were as rich and dramatic as any humans. Through her careful study and meticulous note-taking, she learned amazing things about our closest cousins. She saw them make and use tools. She learned that they were omnivores who lived mostly on fruit, but sometimes hunted and ate meat. She learned about their sex lives, their social lives, their power struggles, and their close family bonds. She documented everything and showed the world what life was like for wild chimpanzees. After a while, Goodall set up a banana feeding station that allowed her to get even closer to the chimps. We devised a concrete banana box, rigged with a wire to open or close the door. But this rationing system was not completely chimpanzee-proof. They pried off lids, pulled open pins, unlatched catchers, pulled on cords, even unscrewed bolts. Their skill in manipulation and their ability to reason made them fascinating subjects for study. In a move that caused some controversy, she gave each individual chimp a name. I soon began to recognize some as individuals and gave them names that seemed to suit them. In their looks and personalities, they are as distinct one from another as human beings. Mr. McGregor stood out because of his bald crown and shoulders. He reminded me of the crusty old gardener Mr. McGregor in the Peter Rabbit books. Ollie is very shy and doesn't make friends easily and Melissa is spiteful and tends to harbor grudges. Goodall's first ten years of work at Gombe led her, and the rest of the world, to think that chimp society was for the most part peaceful and lovely, and that chimps were like nicer versions of us. In the mid-1960s, National Geographic made a documentary about her work that made her world famous. She published scientific papers, she got her PhD from Cambridge, she started accepting students at Gombe. Her groundbreaking study thrived. Her name, Jane Goodall. She was 26 years old and destined to make scientific history. 
But then, around 1970, a series of events started to unfold. Something that no one had ever seen before, and no one since had been able to find the cause of. These events shattered Goodall's chimpanzee paradise and forever changed our understanding of chimpanzees and ourselves. I am Joseph Felbloom, and I am an evolutionary anthropologist at uh, Duke University. Should I <laughs> keep going? <laughs> and I study chimpanzee behavior in the wild at Gombe National Park in Tanzania. Feldblum, like Jane Goodall, is a Leakey Foundation grantee. He's studied the strange and brutal events Jane Goodall and her team started to witness at Gombe. In the early 60s, Jane established this feeding station, which was a bit above the beach in the Kakombe Valley. And she actually started it accidentally where a particularly bold chimp came into her camp and stole some bananas. And she realized that this was something that appealed to the chimps. And so they started slowly experimenting and formalizing the system of provisioning. The chimps could come and get bananas from a big metal box. Researchers would hang out nearby to record their comings and goings and write down everything they did. There were about 45 chimps in the community who would come to the feeding station. In the mid-1960s, Goodall and the other researchers who had joined her at Gombe started to notice a sort of a slow unraveling of the normal chimp social order. This was maybe the first sign that there was some sort of subdivision among the individuals that they knew. The changes were subtle at first. They started to notice that chimps, who used to hang out together and arrive at the station together, started to arrive from different directions. Some of the chimps started to come from the north and some from the south. But, you know, this was a, still a pretty stable situation and there was no indication from the interactions among those individuals when they were, they were at the feeding station that there was any tension between them in any sort of cliquish way. Gradually, the groups really started to split apart. Here's Jane Goodall speaking at a 1978 Leakey Foundation lecture. In 1970, our large main study community began to divide. After two years, the communities were two separate entities, no more friendly relationships between the males of these two groups. And if the two parties, two groups met one another, then they would display, they would make a lot of noise, and both retreat. From there, the tension continued to build, and as the months passed, the split between the formerly friendly chimps was complete. By 1973, researchers recognized the southern subgroup as a separate community, and they called them Kahama after the valley that seemed to form the center of their range. Seven adult males, three females, and their young formed the new southern Kahama group. The northern group was called the Kasakela community. This northern group was much larger. It had eight adult males, 12 females and their young. As the months passed, encounters between the groups got more and more hostile, especially between the males, who started to gang up and go on patrols. When male chimpanzees go on patrol, they gather together in a group. They don't make any noise, which is unusual for chimps. They line up single file and they move silently on all fours on the ground. They stop frequently to look for signs of outsiders. Sometimes they'll climb trees and, and look out uh, to sort of scan the terrain. Patrols usually happen around the border of a community's territory where it meets the territory of an outside community. They started going on these patrols into the Kahama Range, and then in early 1974, the first attack was observed. Four years after the community began to divide, two years after the division we considered was complete, a series of extraordinarily brutal attacks began, which resulted in the killing or probable killing of all seven of those males who moved down to the south and at least one of the three adult females. Four of these attacks were seen. And they weren't at all like the kind of attacks that go on within a community. These lasted between 10 and 20 minutes. They were, in all cases, perpetrated by between three and six adult males. 
and they inflicted extremely severe wounds. These attacks horrified and traumatized Goodall and everyone at Gombe. Nothing like it had ever been seen before. Here's how Jane Goodall described the first assault in her 1982 book called Through a Window. The assault began when a Casacala patrol of six adult males suddenly came upon the young male, Hody, feeding in a tree. So silently had the aggressors approached that Hody was not aware of them until they were almost upon him, and then it was too late. He leapt down and fled, but Humphrey, Figgin, and the heavyweight, Jomeo, were close behind, running shoulder to shoulder with the others racing after them. Humphrey was the first to grab Hody, seizing one of his legs and throwing him to the ground. Figgin, Jomeo, Sherry, and Everett pounded and stamped on their victim, while Humphrey pinned him to the ground, sitting on his head and holding his legs with both hands. Hody had no chance to escape, no chance to defend himself. Rodolph, the oldest of the Casacala males, hit and bit at the hapless victim whenever he saw an opening, and Gigi, who was also present, charged back and forth around the melee. All the chimpanzees were screaming loudly, Hody in terror and pain, the aggressors in a state of enraged frenzy. And basically what happened was that over the course of four years, and later they called this the four-year war, the males of the Casacala community were observed or strongly suspected to have killed off the Kahama community. And then, and in total, all seven males of the Kahama community disappeared, after which the Casacala males sort of annexed the territory that was formerly occupied by the Kahama community. It took time for her to get used to this new understanding of what chimpanzees were capable of. Jane has said that she thought of chimpanzees as this species that's more peaceful than humans and and possibly could sort of serve as a model to help us get ourselves right and treat each other better. And so this forced a really serious sort of reckoning with the nature of of chimpanzees in general. I mean, it, it showed that not only were they violent, but in fact, that you know, they, they engage in this sort of proto-warlike behavior that, that resembles some of the warlike behavior that is observed in pre-industrial human societies even. It was a really fundamental shift in the way that we see both chimpanzees and then also sort of our place as humans in, in nature. For the victors of the four-year war, life went on. And scientists were left sort of stunned and baffled about what had happened. It was hard for these scientists to explain it, in part because they had nothing to compare it to. No other event like it had been seen at any chimpanzee research site. Yeah, it was sort of a mystery about why it happened. There were, there were basically two, or maybe three hypotheses that were described by contemporary researchers about what happened. Some thought maybe it was the feeding station that caused it. Maybe they were two separate communities all along, who only came together for the free bananas. And then maybe when the feeding started to slow down, things got violent. Or maybe they were one group that was already in the process of slowly splitting when Goodall arrived. And maybe the feeding station kept them together for a while. These were sort of the things that people described at the time. But what we were interested in was that no one had attempted a really a quantitative uh, approach to trying to, to, to resolve these sort of disagreeing hypotheses. The four-year war has been an unsolved mystery ever since it happened, and it's been a cause of much debate among scientists. Researchers have observed aggression and deadly violence between different groups of chimpanzees at Gombe and at other research sites. Chimps fight. That's not unusual. But this, where one community split in two and formerly friendly chimps turned on each other, it remained a mystery for decades. The real answer was hidden in the field notes and records of chimp behavior that Goodall began in 1960 and that her successors have continued to this day. The records are archived at Duke University, where Joseph Feldblum works. His advisor and the co-author of his study, Anne Pusey, worked for years to digitize these records. So we had this trove of data from this period, and then also we're lucky that in the intervening years, 
there have been some really powerful analytic techniques that we, we discovered could help us shed light on this issue. The technique he's talking about is called social network analysis. And Feldblum learned about it when he went to a sociology conference a few years ago. It's a way of mapping and analyzing relationships between individuals. He heard about an iconic sociology study called Zachary's Karate Club that applied social network analysis to show how tensions between members of a karate club led it to split apart. With social network analysis and the detailed field notes at his fingertips, Feldblum could look at the entire social world of the Gombe chimps during the time period leading up to the community split and also during the war. He was able to see each chimp's social ties through things like whether two chimps arrived at the feeding station at the same time and from the same direction. And with chimps, that sort of thing matters. We created social networks out of joint first arrivals at the feeding station with the idea that if two individuals arrive together at the beginning of a day, then probably they were spending time together elsewhere in the forest beforehand. And he thought maybe he could use this kind of analysis to solve the mystery of the four-year war. Goodall's observational data from before the war was key. What were the normal patterns, and how did they start to change? The first question he needed to answer, though, was, did the large group really split in the first place, or were they two communities all along? And it turns out, they really did split. Once we found that, then we had a second set of questions that we wanted to ask, which was what factors might have precipitated this. This question was a lot more tricky to answer, and it's something no one has been able to figure out until now. Feldblum had a few ideas when he first started his study. We created this big timeline of all of these events. And so these were changes to the sort of schedule uh, frequency of provisioning bananas when chimpanzees entered the, the feeding station. And then there were changes to the dominance hierarchy. So, so there were several in the years since Jane first arrived. Even though a lot of chimp life revolves around fruit, the banana feeding station didn't seem to cause the problem. Things started to unravel in the community right after the death of a respected elder chimp who was kind of a bridge between the chimps in the northern and southern communities. This elder chimp, whose name was Leaky, named after Lewis Leaky, had friends in both groups. Well, in some other species, we've seen that the death of sort of important high-ranking individuals doesn't have much of a long-term effect on, on network structure. So, so we're discounting that a bit, but I wanted to mention it especially because, uh, you know, Leaky was near and dear to our hearts. After Leaky died, a chimp named Humphrey became the alpha male. But his position was weak, and he was constantly challenged by two brothers named Charlie and Hugh. So now Feldblum's social network investigation takes a turn towards a Game of Thrones power struggle. And we hear the term alpha male a lot, so I just want to take a minute to describe what that means in a chimpanzee community. Chimps live in big social groups. They have a social hierarchy that's dominated by males. The male at the top, the one who has the highest rank, he controls the group and settles the day-to-day -day squabbles. He also gets priority access to mating and food. Alpha male doesn't necessarily mean the biggest, strongest, toughest, meanest guy. The alpha is often the one who's best at forming alliances and the best at the politics of group living. Alpha males come and go, and Gombe in the 60s and 70s was a time of political turmoil. There's some evidence from Gombe and, and from elsewhere that different alpha males have different sort of alpha styles. And so um, there was a male named Goblin who I had formed a lot of alliances and he um, directed joint aggression with other males towards subordinates fairly often. And then there was, a, there was a, the most famous alpha male in Gombe was Frodo and he wasn't particularly fond of forming alliances, and uh, he sort of did it all himself. And so um, so different males do have different strategies. So the second alpha at Gombe was Mike, and uh, he was alpha from, I think, about 1964 until about 1970 or 71. And he was, was not a particularly big, big male, but he was famous for taking the sort of empty oil drums that were left over at Gombe 
that, that people had brought. And he would, when he would do his displays, he, he would roll these in front of him and it would make this unholy racket and terrify all the other males. And so he sort of used his cunning to cement himself at the top of the hierarchy for a while. After Mike was Humphrey, who rose to power after Leakey died. He wasn't a particularly secure alpha male, and that contributes to this story. Hugh and Charlie, the two brothers who were part of the Southern group, became increasingly aggressive towards Humphrey. So it was this definitely this sort of palpable tension between these three in particular that you know researchers at the time noted. The rest of the chimps chose sides. And then the real brutality began. Humphrey and his northern community killed every single male in the southern group and took over their territory. They also took the three surviving females from the southern group. In fact, Feldblum's study suggests that the limited number of sexually available females in the forest at the time was the other cause. And so we think that probably the most likely catalysts were the dominance struggle between uh, Humphrey, Charlie, and Hugh and the changing operational sex ratio. Ambition, power, jealousy, sex, the same things that can cause clashes in our own human societies. And like with humans, the hostility rippled out from the rivals and affected the whole community because of all the social ties between the chimps. Feldblum and his team's results mirror what researchers have seen in other primates, including humans. A previous analysis of schisms in nearly 50 human societies worldwide found that internal political conflict frequently comes before a split in human groups, followed closely by competition for scarce resources. And Feldblum is interested in some of the bigger questions that the data from Gombe illuminates. A big question in behavioral ecology is just sort of why do animals spend time in groups in the first place? He says that understanding why social groups break down can give clues about the forces that bind social groups together in the first place. Maybe the events at Gombe can help us better see patterns and learn when human conflicts might be brewing as well. Given that we think that humans evolved from a chimpanzee-like common ancestor of chimps and humans, this sort of can put human conflict, human social organization in evolutionary perspective. What's also interesting is some of these analytic techniques that we use to study chimpanzee social structure for this project and then for upcoming projects were really developed in the human social sciences. In in many cases, we might be able to start making more explicit comparisons between chimpanzee social structure and, and human social structure that can give us further insight into human social organization. After the events of the Four-Year War, this kind of organized violence among chimpanzees of the same community wasn't seen again until now. As we were reporting this story, a split that's been building for years has been confirmed at a field research site in Uganda. A new civil war has broken out. Researchers there say they have brothers fighting brothers, sons fighting with their mothers, and fathers with their offspring. Once again, it's upsetting for researchers to witness, but this time, they'll at least have a better understanding of some of the causes and tools to make sense of what's going on in front of their eyes. Thanks to Joseph Feldblum for sharing his work, and thanks, of course, to Jane Goodall. Check out our website, leakyfoundation.org, to see our new video about Jane Goodall and the Leakey Foundation. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit organization that funds human origins research and shares discoveries. This year, the Leakey Foundation is celebrating 50 years of exploration, discovery, and sharing our human story. You can support this show and the science we talk about by making a donation to the Leakey Foundation today. Jeannie Newman and two anonymous supporters are offering a matching challenge just for Origin Stories listeners. Thanks to them, your donation will be quadrupled, up to $5,000. Your $5 will become $20, your $10 will become $40. If you gave $50, it would turn into $200 to help produce more Origin Stories episodes. Go to leakyfoundation.org slash Origin Stories Challenge and make a donation today. 
It will really help us, and we really appreciate it. The link is in your show notes. Another way to help is to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Tell a friend, tweet about the show. All of that helps people find us, and it means a lot. This season of Origin Stories was made possible by support from Dixon Long, Camilla Smith, Jeannie Newman, and donors like you. This episode was produced by me, Meredith Johnson, with producer Shuka Kalantari. Our editor is Julia Barton. Sound design is by Katie McMurrin. Our theme music is by Henry Nagel. This season, we're celebrating the Foundation's 50th anniversary by sharing incredible lectures from the Foundation's archive. So we'll be back in two weeks with a talk from Carl Sagan, recorded in 1977. Thanks for listening.